Hello and welcome. I'm Don Renfrew and for the next hour or so I'm going to be talking on the topic of vascular imaging. I'm a private practice radiologist with the group Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. We're a group of about 30 radiologists that cover nine different community hospitals in the central portion of uh, Wisconsin. I work mostly at this hospital, which is Door County Memorial Hospital in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Sturgeon Bay is a beautiful resort community which is located between Green Bay, the geographic structure, not the town, and Lake Michigan. It's on the Sturgeon Bay uh, uh, geographic structure as well. And uh, you can tell where it is on this map by the little red star. It's kind of in the thumb of Wisconsin's mitten. Uh, the hospital is a 25-bed acute care, uh, I'm sorry, critical access facility, and it's about 50 miles from the nearest other hospital. I'm the director of radiology there, and uh, one of my jobs at Door County Memorial Hospital is to uh, run grand rounds. When speaking with primary care providers and those who ordered radiology studies at grand rounds, it came to my attention that they're often uh, less interested in the physics and, uh, for example, fine detailed anatomy or lengthy differential diagnoses as they are uh, in what study to order for a given symptom. In this regard, I decided to make a set of lectures that have to do with what study to order under what set of clinical circumstances uh, and for what different symptoms. And that's what this lecture um, is all about. It's about vascular imaging. Now, the lecture is for primary care practitioners. Um, in the past, much of the primary care uh, medicine done in the United States was provided by internists and family medicine physicians. Internists a while ago started sort of phasing out of doing primary care, and more and more of them are now specializing in such subspecialties as cardiology and nephrology and so forth. Um, family medicine uh, is drawing fewer of the graduating medical students than it has in the past. And it seems like much primary care may end up being, doing by, do, uh, being done by nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in time to come. This lecture is basically to try to uh, address those audiences of primary care providers who are ordering uh, radiology studies on the vascular system. Um, now, you have a lot of options uh, when it comes to imaging the vascular system, but at the same time, you want to order the right study the first time every time. And I'm going to try to help you do that. Now, I do have uh, uh, three main points that I'm going to try to make in this talk. Um, unlike some of the other talks I've given in this lecture series, um, it, this isn't quite as, as, as straightforward. Usually what I try to do is have three major points that I make during the lecture and then uh, repeat those frequently and have all the other data in the lecture kind of support those three major points. This lecture doesn't really fit that mold quite as well as it, it, it could. And the reason is it's, it's sort of a miscellaneous set of topics. Indeed, I will talk about symptoms in several cases, but there's not really any one you know, one or two or three symptoms that have to do with the vascular tree. And the symptoms that you get kind of vary as to which organ you're talking about. Um, so it's a little hard to have, you know, just three simple points. It, this is going to feel a little bit more like a miscellaneous, so, you know, we'll talk about one part of the vascular tree for a while and we'll talk about another part. Nonetheless, I'll try to make it as clear and straightforward and concise as possible so that uh, it will provide you with some good information. Now, uh, so my points are, uh, first, CT angiography, MR angiography, and ultrasound studies have largely supplanted diagnostic catheter studies. The second point I'm going to make is that I'm going to try to provide a brief review of topics covered in some of the other lectures I've given. And finally, for uh, um, for those uh, topics, vascular topics that I don't cover in the other lectures, I'm going to cover them specifically in this lecture. So the first point is then that CT angiography, MR angiography, and ultrasound studies have largely supplanted um, uh, diagnostic catheter studies. Um, the reference standard, the gold standard uh, for uh, 
vascular studies for a long time have been the has been catheter angiography, uh, but diagnostic catheter angiography has been largely replaced, at least for screening purposes in the in the initial diagnosis stage by other methods. In general, vascular ultrasounds now widely used for screening and follow-up exams, and I'll kind of cover some examples of that. And it's often supplemented uh, or replaced by computed tomographic angiography, or CTA, or magnetic resonance angiography, or MRA, when a more definitive evaluation is required or when ultrasound can't be used. Uh, CT has the advantage of higher spatial resolution. It's a little bit less subject to motion artifact than MR. MR using flow technique can be performed without any contrast, however, uh, and, uh, and that can be quite helpful in those patients with uh, contrast allergy or renal insufficiency. Uh, the, note that the contract, contrast enhanced MR often will pro provide you with some better images, however. Now, catheter angiography nowadays is usually con used to confirm or disprove results that you obtain from non-vascular imaging or no, I'm sorry, non-invasive vascular imaging, and to allow for intravascular and intravascular intervention. In other words, if you have an aneurysm, you can put a coil in it. If you have a stenosis, you can put a stent across it, etc. So usually that's when you're doing catheter angiography in the interventional sense. So now beyond those generalizations, specific recommendations for vascular imaging vary a lot by body part. I'm going to first briefly review topics that I've covered in other lectures, and then I'm going to talk about vascular imaging studies of the arterial tree and the venous side, which I don't cover in, in uh, other lectures. Uh, vascular imaging is performed relatively frequently in asymptomatic individuals for screening purposes, and I am going to cover that a little bit too. So, first of all, uh, a brief review of some of the topics I've covered elsewhere. Um, it, now, each of these topics could take an entire lecture uh, of an hour long in themselves, and uh, in the interest of completeness, uh, you may want to look at those other uh, lectures, but I'm going to try to briefly review the, the high points of, of some of the topics here. How about suspected renovascular hypertension? Now, uh, when, you, when do you suspect renovascular hypertension? Again, alluding back to that prior conference, uh, if you have severe or refractory hypertension, which is three drug regimen re resistant, if you have an acute rise over a previously stable value, if you have onset of hypertension before puberty, or onset before 30 in a non-obese patient without a family history, then you should think in terms of renovascular hypertension. Um, if you're thinking of renovascular hypertension, what, is, what study do you order and why? Well, the lesion you're looking for predominantly is renal artery stenosis, and you have three choices, CT angiography, MR angiography, and nuclear medicine renal scintigraphy with an ACE inhibitor. At least in my institution, and for our purposes, uh, CT angiography is typically the study of choice. Uh, it's less prone to uh, uh, motion artifact. Um, it probably has a little better spatial resolution on average than MR angiography. Nuclear medicine can only tell you indirectly whether there's stenosis, and in those cases where there is stenosis, you need to do a, a, an imaging study uh, which actually depicts the degree of stenosis before you can proceed usually anyway. So I uh, tend not to use a renal study unless there's a contrast allergy issue or a renal insufficiency issue. Um, okay, here's an example uh, of a 54-year-old man with multiple vascular lesions and hypertension. He was becoming less responsive to his medical regimen for treatment of his hypertension. On the left, there's a CT angiogram showing stenosis of the left renal artery. And on the right, a follow-up CT after angioplasty shows decreased stenosis. The patient's hypertension uh, was more easily to control and, and stayed in better range uh, with fewer medications after the angioplasty. So this is a case of uh, renal artery stenosis resulting in renovascular hypertension, or at least contributing to it. So that's renovascular hypertension. Uh, another genital urinary, if you will, uh, vascular condition is a varicocele. Um, now, remember, varicoceles can cause chronic scrotal pain, or they can present as a painless mass, or they can present with pain and a mass, and so they're a vascular lesion. The root problem is venous drainage. Um, on the left side of the human uh, male anatomy, the testicular vein, runs from the testicle to the left renal vein where it enters at about a perpendicular angle. 
This makes the left side more prone to reflux and varicocele formation. Ultrasound will demonstrate a uh, so-called bag of worms appearance adjacent to the testicle um, in either a swollen or painful or both test uh, scrotum. And the color flow images will show an abundant flow, uh, such as seen in this picture here. This was a 16-year-old with a painless mass in the left scrotum. Uh, the left image shows a grayscale ultrasound uh, image with a typical bag of worms appearance. Um, and uh, here seen at the arrow, um, color doctor examination, uh, which is seen on the other side of this image, shows you the beautiful uh, areas of flow coming away, uh, going away from and coming toward the transducer, giving you that uh, spotted green, uh, spotted orange, and, and blue appearance. Okay, so that's varicocele, another vascular uh, lesion covered in other lectures are. Um, uh, headaches cause secondary to vascular conditions of uh, aneurysm rupture and arterial venous malformations. Um, so the, uh, about 20% of patients who state that they're having the worst headache of their life will actually have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, when a CT demonstrates an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage in this condition, you really need to establish the cause as rapidly as possible. Without treatment, the likelihood of death in the next 30 days is greater than 50%. Uh, after you discover the subarachnoid hemorrhage, the next step is usually either catheter angiography, such as in this case, uh, or a CT angiogram to evaluate for a leaking aneurysm. So this is a vascular cause of, of headache. Um, another vascular cause of headache uh, and is, a, is a rare event, but rarely intracranial hemorrhages will occur secondary to arteriovenous malformations. CT studies can show uh, hemorrhage in the emergent condition. MR study can show hemorrhage in a bag of worms appearance from the vascular malformation. Uh, in this 45-year-old woman with headache and left facial droop, the MR venogram shows you a large vascular malformation at the location of the arrow there. Um, you can work these up also with catheter angiography and at the same time uh, perform interventions with vascular angiography designed to uh, improve the patient's symptoms. All right, another topic uh, covered elsewhere is chest pain and vascular causes of chest pain include coronary artery disease and pulmonary embolism. Um, as far as pulmonary embolism goes, uh, anyone with acute onset of shortness of breath and chest pain should be suspected to have a pulmonary embolism and the appropriate uh, action needs to be taken. Decision rules, such as are outlined in this table, have been developed to decide whether it's appropriate to order a pulmonary angiogram. Um, and basically, you give the patient points for different clinical features and add up the points. And then if they have enough points, they get a uh, CT study for pulmonary, angi uh, pulmonary uh, embolism. Even if they don't have enough points, if they have a positive D-dimer, they tend to get a CT angiogram of the pulmonary arterial tree. Um, the study of choice is a CT angiogram unless there's contrast allergy or renal insufficiency. It's uh, the CT's time to take maximum advantage of the contrast column in the pulmonary arterial tree. Uh, and you're looking basically for pulmonary embolism, but you can also diagnose pulmonary infarction. Features of right heart failure like a distended main pulmonary artery, a distended right ventricle, and bowing of the interventricular septum of the heart. Um, these findings are prognostic indicators for poor prognosis in a patient with pulmonary embolism because right heart failure is usually what kills those people. Um, the study can also show alternative diagnoses explaining chest pain and shortness of breath like pulmonary edema and pneumonia. How about coronary artery disease? Well, for coronary artery disease, usually uh, in patients with chest pain and an appropriate uh, uh, pain pattern, you need to kind of figure out uh, where the risk is for those with intermediate risk of a heart attack, a stress EKG supplemented by either a nuclear medicine, or often supplemented rather by nuclear medicine by cardiac perfusion study is used. It's hard to see this study, this magnification. Um, blowing it up, the top images show the left ventricle during stress. There's an abnormal perfusion along the apex and lateral wall. Then at rest, there's normal perfusion, and this is basically diagnostic of a reversible ischemic disease. 
indicating significant coronary artery disease. Um, this is a computer generated map which shows the same thing. Uh, on the left picture, STR means stress, and that demonstrates high numbers where there's a lack of perfusion. Then the middle picture is RST means rest, shows nearly completely normal distribution with a bunch of zeros. And then the right picture, which is RDB means reversibility, shows the difference between the two. And that again indicates reversible coronary arterial disease. And these patients, you know, as a primary care provider, you're going to usually refer these to a cardiologist and typically they'll consider uh, cardiac catheterization. Okay, so that takes us uh, to kind of through the topics of some of the other areas of the vascular tree. Um, the other point of this lecture is in addition to the first two points that catheter angiography has been supplanted by other forms of imaging and the fact that many of the topics I'm going to talk about are included in the lectures. The third point is that um, specific imaging will vary with the anatomic location of the patient. Uh, this is a broad point, and I, and I do kind of wish there was a better way to coagulate these different principles I'm talking about, but for better or worse, it, it is kind of hard to make any generalizations about the entire vascular tree. And what I'm going to do is just kind of hit some high points about different body uh, parts. Now, intracranial aneurysms, um, again, in, in the headache lecture, I covered symptomatic intracranial aneurysms, as I mentioned a few moments ago. Um, now this is the same patient that we saw the subarachnoid hemorrhage on the CT. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this image, the image on the left is actually a 27-year-old woman with a changing pattern of migraine headaches. Uh, those usually, uh, migraine headaches don't usually require imaging, um, but the MR angiogram did show an aneurysm. The image on the right is the same 60-year-old man that had a thunderclap headache or the worst headache of his life and came into the ER and had the subarachnoid hemorrhage we showed a few moments ago. The um, imaging study here, the arrow shows uh, aneurysm demonstrated on catheter angiography. He later had a coil placed in that aneurysm and did well postoperatively. So those are symptomatic aneurysms. What about asymptomatic intracranial aneurysms? What do you do with those? Well, they can be discovered either incidentally during imaging for some unrelated symptom, um, or they can be discovered because of screening. In both cases, the current recommendations are to monitor small aneurysms annually for two to three years, and then if the aneurysm grows in that interval, refer for consideration of intervention, coiling, resection, whatever. If the aneurysm is stable, extending the monitoring interval to, uh, from two to five years is, is appropriate. Small in this context generally means less than 10 millimeters, although some authorities use 7 millimeters for these aneurysms. The risk of rupture and slash or bleeding goes up with the larger size of aneurysms, so 2 or 3 millimeter aneurysms are you know, often best ignored. Uh, 12 to 14 to 15 millimeter aneurysms are very worrisome. Um, you know, ones between 7 and 10, a little harder to know what to do with. Of course, the screening, you have to take into account the age and general medical condition of the patient. You want to be more aggressive with younger and healthier patients. Um, now, regarding screen for asymptomatic aneurysms, in other words, you know, do, do we go out and look for aneurysms in patients that don't have symptoms at this time? There really isn't any role for such screening in the general population. There are subsets of the general population which are at high risk. Recommendations usually are not to screen these people. For example, the recommendations are not to screen for genetic syndromes known to be associated with intracranial aneurysms, and not to screen for patients with a single first-degree relative with an intracranial aneurysm, which is bled. If you have uh, patients with two or more first-degree relatives with bleeding intracranial aneurysms, you probably should screen those. And then the role of screening in adult polycystic kidney disease, and remember, Adult polycystic kidney disease is, uh, um, does have associated uh, aneurysms in the circle of Willis and intracranial tree, intra intracranial arterial tree. Uh, whether whether you screen those patients or not is kind of unsettled. Uh, they there are some risk for those aneurysms. Though. Now, what about the so that's the intracranial vasculature and intracranial aneurysms? Kind of working down from the top 
what about the already garbage carotid vessels and in general the other non you know intracranial vasculature so okay uh, like i noted on the lecture on stroke in patients with neurological symptoms that suggest a stroke you really want to do a facilitated workup and it's got to be uh, you know typically we include either an mr of the brain um, plus either an ultrasound cta or mra of the carotid arteries and you're looking for any causative lesion the main purpose is to find stenotic arterial lesions and, which are going to benefit from carotid and arterectomy. Um, so what are the current recommendations? Well, current recommendations call for the carotid and arterectomy for patients, symptomatic patients, with 70 to 99% stenosis, and for men, but not for women, with 50 to 70% stenosis. And the recommendations for women are different because clinical trials have shown less benefit for CEA or carotid and arterectomy compared with medical treatment in women with less than 70% stenosis. Uh, facilitated workup is important. It seems that the shorter the delay between symptoms and surgery, the better the outcome. Um, and the best outcomes are when the surgery is performed within about two weeks of the neurologic event. Um, if you do ultrasound initially to evaluate stenosis and find stenosis, then you usually want to do an MRA or a CTA to confirm those results because ultrasound tends to overestimate stenosis, although sometimes it underestimates it. It doesn't provide direct visual assessment of the stenosis typically as well as a CTA or MRA does. And for symptomatic disease with less than 50% stenosis, annual follow-ups usually recommended to document stability with referral if there's progression of the disease. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, here's a patient with a stroke. Uh, note the restricted diffusion in the uh, left hemisphere here at the location of the arrow. Um, vascular imaging was performed in this particular case. We did CT angiography. Uh, now, the axial CT angiogram images show atherosclerotic vascular calcification and um, less than 50% stenosis of the left internal carotid artery there where the arrows are. Um, in this particular case, we also did a uh, 3D maximum intensity projection MR angiogram and that confirmed less than 50% stenosis in the left internal carotid artery. It usually wouldn't be uh, necessary to do both CT and MR angiograms in, in these cases. It was done in this case. And uh, here's a composite kind of showing you narrowing but less than 50% stenosis, so it wasn't really considered a candidate for carotid and arterectomy. Here's an 84-year-old man who had slurred speech and decreased strength in the right arm. Again, the axial diffusion weighted MR shows a focus of restricted diffusion uh, diagnostic with acute infarct here at the arrow. He had slurred speech and decreased strength in his right arm, as we mentioned, so we went ahead and did a carotid ultrasound study and it shows peak systolic and internal carotid artery, common carotid artery, or ICA, CCA ratio compatible with mild stenosis or less than 50% stenosis. Um, his CT study, and these are sort of a little bit of like reconstructions through the uh, normal and abnormal side, um, show you a fair amount of narrowing on the uh, abnormal side. Uh, here at the location of the arrows, you can compare the pretty wide open normal side in the greater than 50%, probably greater than 70% stenosis of the abnormal side. And this gentleman who had had an acute stroke also had significant arterial stenosis and needed a carotid endarterectomy. Now, um, in general, expert groups, including the United States Preventive Services Task Force and the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association, and the American Society of Neuroimaging all recommend against screening the general population for carotid stenosis. Bruies of the carotids are typically a better indicator of general vascular disease, like coronary artery disease and more extremity arterial disease, contralateral carotid disease, than they are vipsilateral carotid stenosis. In men between 40 and 75 years of age, uh, where a study of the carotids after auscultation of a brewie or a community um, screening program on a self-referral basis has discovered a stenosis, then CEA should probably be considered in those patients with a stenosis of over 70%, which is sort of the same 
conclusion uh, or similar to the conclusion that you have if they're symptomatic. If they're symptomatic, you probably operate it a little in a little bit more aggressive fashion. So here's an 84-year-old woman uh, who had uh, carotid stenosis on the left side, even though she had a right carotid brood. Uh, the ultrasound shows higher peak systolic velocity and an increased ICA-CCA ratio on the uh, left side, even though her brewery was on the contralateral right side. So again, the brewery kind of indicates general vascular disease. Here's a 73-year-old woman who came in after an abnormal uh, community screening program and did not have any symptoms. And this uh, diagnostic carotid ultrasound showed dense calcification and it was hard to find flow in her artery. Um, the uh, CT angiogram, where the white arrow is, shows a trickle of flow. That black arrow is actually along calcification along the periphery of her proximal internal carotid artery on her uh, diseased side. And she had a high grade, you know, probably 90 plus percent stenosis and uh, just a trickle of flow through there. So she was operated on with a carotid endarterectomy. So that sort of imaging of the carotid arteries, uh, working our way down again, thoracic aortic aneurysm. What about thoracic aortic aneurysm? Well, you know, typically patients with a symptomatic thoracic aortic aneurysm, they're generally direly ill because they've ruptured or dissected the aneurysm, and they'll be coming to the emergency room with severe chest pain. They'll typically undergo an emergency uh, chest CT study, and you know you're basically trying to figure out whether they've got a thoracic aortic dissection or pulmonary embolism, uh, or sometimes a myocardial infarction. And in most cases, the dissection requires emergent and hopefully life-saving intervention. Although it's tough, this is a tough disease to treat um, when you rupture or dissect a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Some chronic thoracic aortic aneurysms may cause a symptom of chest pressure. Uh, now, asymptomatic thoracic aneurysms, on the other hand, are generally discovered during chest imaging for unrelated symptoms. For example, you could be doing an echocardiogram for evaluating cardiac function or valvular anatomy um, and see dilatation of the aortic root. You could do a chest x-ray when you're looking for cough and fever and see a dilated aortic root. Uh, chest x-rays can't really differentiate aneurysmal distension of the aorta from tortuosity. So patients with an abnormal aortic contour usually need to undergo uh, evaluation with CTA or MRA to figure out what's going on with the aortic arch. Uh, now, for those patients with incidentally discovered asymptomatic thoracic aneurysms, CTA or MRA can evaluate important anatomic features, such as whether the aneurysm involves the ascending aorta and the descending aorta, whether it extends into the abdomen, uh, what sort of great vessel pattern is involved in terms of the branch vessels coming off the aorta. You can also measure the aortic aneurysm, and the risk is uh, pretty directly related to size. One study found that the uh, five-year risk of rupture was 0% for aneurysms less than 40 millimeters, 16% for aneurysms between 40 and 59, and 31% for those greater than 16 millimeters. Uh, because of studies like that, the uh, these uh, these uh, studies lead to in, uh, indications, for, uh, lead, lead to the following recommendations for follow-up when you have a known thoracic aneurysm. You want to do a repeat study in six months uh, after the aneurysm discovery, and then if you see that it's stable, you usually do annual studies after that. You want to use typically the same kind of scanner and equipment that you used when you initially found the aneurysm to follow it, because then, then uh, measurements are directly comparable. Um, if you get above 50 millimeters in the ascending aorta, above 60 millimeters in the descending aorta, or you grow an aneurysm more than 10 millimeters a year, then these are usually indications for surgical consultation and or intervention. So that leads us to slide 90, which is a 91-year-old woman with chest pain. And uh, she was not a candidate for any kind of surgery, but she did end up having repeated chest CTs done over a period of time uh, for other reasons, including recurrent chest pain. On her initial exam on 11-206, you have a, a pretty large aneurysm with a setting aorta, which is 
pass that criteria to trigger intervention, but of course, those are a surgical candidate. The error was on the uh, aneurysm, uh, so that was diagnosed. She came back in, 12, 29, 08, you can see the aneurysm is getting larger there, and probably has a little uh, either calcification or hematoma in the wall of the uh, aorta with some increased density along the periphery there that wasn't there before. And then finally on 212 of 2010, um, she came in once more and was found to have an additional uh, increase in her aneurysm size, and she succumbed shortly after that. Here's an 84 year old man with chest pressure, and what the chest x rays show is that on the initial study there, uh, he has a dilated distended aorta on A, and then on a follow up study, you know, done 18 months later, uh, he had increasing chest pressure sensation, the aneurysm was getting larger, so even the chest film showed it in that case. Um, this 67-year-old man had a known thoracic aneurysm, and this slide is basically to make the point that you're following this aneurysm and you're using the same technique and the same machinery, and this 51 millimeter aneurysm was indeed stable year after year. Um, so that's thoracic aortic aneurysms. Okay, how about abdominal aortic aneurysms, kind of moving down uh, one notch at a time. Um, as with thoracic aortic aneurysms, patients with symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysms are usually direly ill. They'll be in the emergency room. They'll have severe abdominal pain um, if they don't exsanguinate and die first. Uh, the patients will usually undergo emergency abdominal CT and then emergency surgery if they make it that far. Uh, symptomatic triple A's should undergo immediate evaluation by a surgeon, of course. And uh, patients with AAA may also demonstrate a pulse dial mass, in which case, typically, uh, you know, if, if it's a non painful situation where you just have a pulse dial abdominal mass, you can do an ultrasound or CT. Um, now, most of these triple A's are asymptomatic, um, and they'll be discovered either because you're imaging the abdomen for unrelated abnormality or sometimes because of actual screening. Uh, with respect to screening, uh, patients may have a AAA after they go to the community screening center for the freebie, or sometimes they'll have a AAA uh, when they come to a medical practitioner and have a pulse tile mass. So current recommendations call for screening of any man greater than six years of age with a parent or a sibling with a AAA, and for screening male smokers or ex-smokers sometime between the ages of 65 and 75. How about aneurysms? Well, for aneurysms bigger than five and a half centimeters, they should be referred for surgical consultation. Smaller ones, like those between three and four centimeters, ultrasound can be performed every two to three years to watch those. Aneurysms measuring four to 5.4 should usually be monitored every four to six months. And you refer for surgical consultation if the aneurysm's bigger than five and a half centimeters, or if the aneurysm grows by more than a half a centimeter in a six month period or if the aneurysm in the abdomen becomes symptomatic. All these are surgical uh, indications. Now, uh, this is an example of an incidentally discovered aortic aneurysm. This is a 74-year-old who had back pain, who was undergoing lumbar MR. Sagittal t one away with lumbar MR showed an aneurysm in the lower abdominal aorta here with the arrow on it. The uh, axial T2 weighted image to, at the level of the upper vertebral body again showed the aneurysm um, here with the arrow on it. And finally, this CT picture on uh, slide 111 shows a contrast enhanced CT angiogram with the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, the CT also uh, has an image with an arrow here showing the aneurysm. And then uh, finally, uh, this uh, kind of gold colored rendering shows you a three dimensional um, uh, surface map of, of the aneurysm. It gives you a nice feel for the tortuosity of the aorta and the exact location of the aneurysm below the takeoff of the renal arteries and above the bifurcation. And this is, of course, a composite picture <coughs> of, this, of the MR. Uh, with the discovery of an aneurysm uh, and uh, subsequent uh, 
uh, work up in imaging. Now, uh, at this point, uh, you know, this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy discussion, but basically, it's kind of a it's kind of it's kind of a tough topic to talk about. And this is intestinal angina, and you have to be sort of suspicious of intestinal angina in certain circumstances. Now, um, patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia or intestinal angina will present with cramping abdominal pain following a meal, especially a large or fat-containing meal, and that will typically reside approximately two hours after the meal. They'll have a little bit different pain pattern than the typical biliary colic, which comes on from a stone kind of drifting down into the cystic duct or fundus of the gallbladder. Uh, their pain is uh, probably more diffuse, more mid-abdominal, more long-lasting, but there are overlaps in pain patterns. So the patients with uh, chronic ischemic, uh, uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia, they can have associated involuntary weight loss because they avoid food um, and because of all the postprandial pain they get. Uh, CTA of the abdominal aorta and branches offers an excellent method for evaluation for suspected intestinal ischemia. Uh, but, you know, given the rich anastomotic connections between the celiac and supramesenteric and inframesenteric vessels and the iliac branch vessels, stenosis or occlusion of any one vessel usually doesn't lead to a lot of symptoms. Uh, usually the anastomosis kind of fill in the area that's blocked and downstream from any one particular stenosis. So the diagnosis is usually made on imaging when there's at least two different vessels that have blockage. Um, now, patients with acute mesenteric ischemia as opposed to chronic mesenteric ischemia, they may have preceding symptoms uh, and, and have a basically an acute on chronic situation where they pass the threshold from intermittent, intermittent symptoms to having permanent symptoms. Uh, patients with acute mesenteric ischemia usually have severe periumbilical pain. Um, and uh, it can be caused by superior mesenteric artery embolism in about half the cases, superior mesenteric artery thrombosis in about a quarter of the cases, mesenteric venous thrombosis in about 5% of the cases, and a, a non-inclusive ischemia in about a quarter of the cases. And each of these causes typically have a different clinical scenario, although patients will often have abdominal pain regardless of the ultimate cause of their problems. Now those with superior mesenteric artery embolism They'll usually have cardiac disease, and the embolism comes from the left atrium or the left ventricle or, or cardiac valve. And those with acute thrombus usually have acute on chronic atherosclerotic disease of the mesenteric vessels with a prior history of intestinal angina, uh, chronic ischemic symptoms, and then an acute exacerbation of that from uh, eventually clogging up an artery altogether. Those with acute venous thrombus may have a history of a hypercoagulable state or they may have portal hypertension or abdominal infection or abdominal trauma. And uh, those with a non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, also called no mean or non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, are usually elderly. They've usually got a cardiac condition or being treated with drugs that reduce their intestinal perfusion. Um, when acute uh, mesenteric ischemia is strongly suspected, angio is usually recommended because it's a reference standard and it may allow for percutaneous intervention. Uh, when angio is unavailable or when the diagnosis of suspicion is not really, really high, CT angiography is a good alternative. It, it allows you to evaluate the arterial tree. It can also look for other uh, findings of bowel infarction and, and also other uh, causes of pain. So like I said, kind of a long discussion there, but basically here's a one example, a 34-year-old woman who was on oral contraceptives. Of course, these are, could make you coagulate. And she had abdominal pain. The axial contrast CT study here showed uh, clot filling the portal vein. So she's got uh, uh, ischemic symptoms on the basis of uh, venous blockage. Um, so that gets us down to abdominal aorta, abdominal vessels, another abdominal vessel issue is gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, evaluation of gastrointestinal bleeding usually relies on endoscopy, uh, but the intermittent nature of the bleeding and the low flow rate can make it difficult to diagnose the source of bleeding with endoscopy. And in these cases, arteriography or CT angiography can be performed, but nuclear medicines allow you to, nuclear medicine studies allow you to show even lower rates of bleeding down to the 0.5 ml per minute and even below that. And that can helpfully uh, direct surgical intervention. Here's a 75 year old uh, man who had uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. Sequential images from a tagged red cell 
nuclear study here show tracer in the right upper quadrant, and then as you follow that through, it looks like it's in the proximal small bowel. Now this patient had already undergone upper and lower endoscopy, and no source of hemorrhage had been found. After the red cell study was done, the patient underwent repeat endoscopy, and at that point, duodenal diverticulum was somewhat more fully investigated than it, gone, than it happened the first time, and there was active bleeding in the diverticulum. So the bleeding study was quite helpful in directing care in this patient. So we're working our way down, or we're extremely arterial evaluation uh, along further in the arterial tree. What about the lower extremity arteries? Well, symptoms of lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, include uh, classic claudication, atypical leg pain, non-healing leg ulcers, and when the arterial stenosis is severe, you can have rest pain. Uh, up to 90% of patients with lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, as determined by angle breakthrough ratio measurements, may be asymptomatic. Now, for patients with the symptoms, the initial diagnostic studies, usually an ABI or ABR determination, angle breakthrough ratio or angle breakthrough index determination, and that involves comparing the blood pressure at the ankle using the posterior tibial dorsalis pedis artery with the higher of a right or left arm pressure measurements. And an ABI of less than 0.9 is diagnostic. Uh, pressures between 0.85 and 0.9 indicate mild arterial impairment. 0.4 to 0.85 is moderate, and then less than 0.4 is severe. ABIs of greater than 1.3 suggest calcified non-compressible vessels, which can also be a source of symptoms. So as I've said, ABI readings of less than 0.9 are abnormal, and, and uh, greater than 1.3 are abnormal. Um, actually, ABI readings of 0.9 and 1.0 are kind of borderline. Those readings should be followed by an exercise exam where you do serial ABI uh, calculations made at one minute intervals after walking on a treadmill for five minutes of two miles an hour at a 12% incline. And what you're looking for is uh, reactivity with that ABI. It should remain stable or increase after exercise if you're normal. If it decreases, especially if it decreases by 20% or more, then that's diagnostic of peripheral arterial disease, the kind of challenge test like the coronary artery test, uh, stress resting studies. Now, so that, that's kind of the asymptomatic patients. For the patients with symptoms, then you, um, uh, the patients with symptoms and, and that have ABI measurements that are abnormal, those are candidates for revascularization. So you can do further evaluation on those patients either with a segmental pressure evaluation or CT angiogram or MR angiogram. The segmental pressure, what it does, it records the blood pressure of the ankle while inflating a blood pressure cuffs at each of several lower extremity locations and you're trying to figure out which vessel it is that's blocked. Uh, you can supplement that by so-called pulse volume recordings. They're helpful when the vessels are calcified. Uh, CTA and MRA can provide a, a visual roadmap of the lower extremity vascular tree documenting the location and then you're going to be able to quantify the degree of arterial stenosis with those studies. Um, and while screening uh, isn't really recommended for the general population, uh, the community screening programs will often screen patients and then they'll come to the primary care provider with abnormal results. Um, now, for th there are some indications for obtaining an ABI, and those include patients at high risk, like those over 50, those who are smokers, and those who are diabetic. Um, so this is an example of a symptomatic woman with left greater than right leg pain, who underwent first uh, segmental pressure evaluation. A little hard to see here on the worksheet, but basically what it shows you is that the left pressures are lower than the contralateral right side. Uh, here's the arterial tracings, and you can see kind of a, a difference in arterial tracings as you go down the leg with the left dropping off compared to the right side. Um, the ankle brachial ratio on the left was significantly lower than on the right side. On the right it was normal, on the left it was diminished. Uh, this is a uh, visual map made by the CT data showing an absence of the femoral artery on the patient's left side. Um, this data, or this map rather, is made from uh, hundreds of consecutive thin axial images. This is one example of those axial images at the level of the pelvis. Here, there are arrows 
on the small white round dots and it's contrast material in the arterial tree going down through the pelvis and into the um, lower extremities. Now note that there is contrast on both sides at this level, but at this level down at the mid thigh, you have contrast on the um, right, but not on the left. Here the arrows kind of point that out. Uh, so this is an example of a patient with uh, occlusion of her femoral vessel on the left side, leading to ischemic symptoms in her lower extremity, leg pain, uh, the uh, segmental pressure evaluation, did show an abnormal ankle brachial ratio and also showed a segmental pressure drop between the high and low thigh cuffs. Pretty much diagnostic of femoral artery disease. So that brings us to the final topic. We're getting down into the lower extremities now. And the final topic is lower extremity venous disease, uh, pain, and swelling. Now, symptoms of acute deep venous thrombosis include pain and swelling of the calf. Other disease processes like muscle tear, lymphangitis, uh, venous insufficiency, and Baker cyst may demonstrate similar clinical features. Um, and the distinction among these entities is important for patient management since a DVT can result in pulmonary embolism and you can have significant associated mortality and morbidity with PEs. Typically, ultrasound exam consists of a combination of grayscale images without and then with compression, uh, and then color Doppler examination and spectral Doppler exam with augmentation to assess for appropriate deep venous flow. Documentation of either a filling defect, as seen in this figure, or a lack of compressibility within the deep venous system is diagnostic of deep venous thrombosis. The exam is typically going to include compression evaluation of at least the popliteal and femoral veins and color flow images of the deep venous system including the calf to evaluate filling defects. Um, another scenario where you'll do lower extremity venous uh, ultrasound, and this is kind of the last topic, um, patients with varicose veins from venous valvular insufficiency, they can have imaging performed of the deep and superficial veins both prior to venous ablation procedures. Uh, the evaluation will include the deep venous system for thrombosis because valvular insufficiency in DVT can both result in like swelling and pain and may coexist. And then the superficial uh, evaluation is for the location and severity of venous valvular insufficiency. Uh, this insufficiency is usually documented at the uh, sapphemeral junction by scanning during Valsalva or with the patient in an upright position. And then you can also document varicose veins and the caliper and depth of the saponous veins, which can be important for surgical planning. So, in summary, again, CT angiography, MR angiography, and ultrasound studies have largely supplanted diagnostic catheter studies. Uh, diagnostic catheter studies are not nearly as frequently used unless there's some problem uh, needing further evaluation or detail. Now, um, Therapeutic catheter angiography continues uh, because there, you have to have a catheter in the vessel in order to instrument the vessel with a stent or with a coil or whatever. Uh, I did review in this talk, in this talk uh, some topics that I covered in other talks. And finally, the specific recommendations for imaging uh, do vary with anatomic location and clinical situation. I've kind of covered things from head to toe here today. Thank you very much for your time.